Welcome to this uh, lecture organized uh, by the Department of Philosophy, Classics and the History of Art and Ideas at uh, the University of Oslo in collaboration with the Center for the Historiography of Linguistics at the KU Leuven and uh, the Linguistics Curriculum at the University of Graz in the framework of the course, uh, The History of Western Linguistics, a Survey in Myths. It is a great pleasure and an honor to introduce to you uh, Professor Alexander uh, Maxwell from the Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, Professor Maxwell is a specialist of nationalism studies who studied at the University of Col California Davis, the University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, and the Central European University in Budapest before getting his PhD in history uh, from the University of Wisconsin in 2003. He is a historian with remarkably broad interests extending to linguistics, physics, sexuality, and science fiction. Notably, he has mastered such diverse languages uh, as German, Czech, Hungarian, and Yiddish, a competence which comes in handy uh, when studying nationalism in the Habsburg Empire and its successor states in the long 19th century, which is his main uh, field of research. And two recent books of his are Everyday Nationalism in Hungary, uh, which was published by the Greuter in 2019, and Choosing Slovakia, Slavic Hungary, the Czechoslovak language and accidental nationalism, which was published by Tauris in 2009. And as, as the title of this second book uh, suggests, Professor Maxwell's work on nationalism has an interesting linguistic uh, dimension, and that is uh, what brings us uh, together today. Uh, and in recent years, he has become fascinated with the, the so-called language dialect dichotomy, a topic with which I'm myself also quite familiar as my PhD was uh, devoted to the early modern history of this uh, dichotomy. And it's also, yeah, therefore no surprise that we are working together on this uh, topic and which a, a collaboration, which I'm enjoying very uh, much. And it's definitely my most global collaboration. And it's, it's also uh, challenging at times because of the time difference. Uh, and Alex, Alexander is 10 hours ahead of me. Uh, so thanks for, for freeing up your night to, to present uh, to us. Um, and but to come back to our language dialect dichotomy he is shown in a, in a beautiful paper how linguists have been using or rather misusing the so-called Weinreich witticism uh, language is a dialect with an army and navy I'm sure many of you know this witticism and today he will enlighten us about the language dialect dichotomy in the work of Noam Chomsky one of the linguists to whom the Weinreich witticism has been misattributed. Prof. Maxwell, Alexander, uh, the floor is yours. Oh. Well, um, thank you for giving me the virtual floor. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for making this uh, event possible. I am also very much enjoying our collaboration. Um, I didn't realize I would have such a, a lengthy introduction from, uh, from Prof. So I actually have a brief introduction of myself. I'm interested in how things become national. My recent book on Hungary has a chapter, for example, on the uh, national mustache. I've also published a, a book chapter on that. And I've published some things like the uh, tobacco smoking. So one doesn't need to smoke tobacco in a national way, but it can be done. And the process of how things become nationalized or how they acquire national meaning, this is my broader research topic. Now, in uh, recent years, I've been working on pan-Slavism. Um, and the pan-Slavism I'm working on is a highly linguistic pan-Slavism. So it uh, has to do with how the language becomes nationalized. Uh, na the language doesn't need to be seen in a national way, but often is. And I find with my pan-Slavs, they have a very interesting national idea, or I mean to say the, a very interesting idea of the national language. They tend to view all Slavs as speaking one language. And uh, Russian, Polish, Czech, and so forth are merely dialects of that language. I've had a whole bunch of uh, grammar books about uh, uh, with um, uh, grammars of a dialect, a dialect of what, a dialect of the Slavic language, and there's a whole bunch. I can, I can bury you in these grammars. But I noticed that when I would present this work on, you know, pan-Slavism, and I would allude to my pan-Slavs and their belief in the single Slavic language, that uh, many people in the audience would get very upset with me. Uh, they would tell me with great agitation that uh, Croatian or Slovak are not dialects, they are languages. 
And I would say, well, you know, I don't really have an opinion that one way or the other, but I want to point out that these historical actors, they said that there was a, was a, a single Slavic language. And that, that doesn't make people happy at all. They say, you need to read some linguistics. So I decided to read some linguistics and to see what linguists have to say about this language dialect question. And I, I found that linguists are all over the map. Here's a, here's a statement, for example, from uh, Edward Sapir, a very famous uh, American linguist who worked on uh, Native American languages. He says, to the linguist, there is no real difference between a dialect and a language which can be shown to be related, however remotely, to another language. Never mind Croatian and Russian being dialects of the same language. According to Sapir, Croatian and English are the same, lang the same language. Never, never mind Russian and English. Russian, English, Croatian, French, and Italian are all just dialects of Punjabi. We're all Indo-Europeans here. They can all just be dialects of the same language, according to Sapir. But I also found, and this is something that seemed more typical of linguistic idea. It's impossible. Here's a, a sample scholar. It is impossible to distinguish a language from a dialect, uh, but um, asserted alongside an assertion like this. Despite difficulties of definition, it is clear that migration across the North Sea did result in the emergence of a distinct language. Now, this is a, a text on the history of English. And so in the first paragraph that I've highlighted, um, the language dialect dichotomy is, is thought to be impossible. It's impossible to do anything with it. And then in the second passage, two paragraphs later, we read that it is clear to do what two paragraphs earlier was impossible. There's a sort of cognitive dissonance at work here. The thing that's impossible is clear. The thing that's clear is impossible. So I became interested in, um, in this in its own right. And uh, some of my work recently has been about criticizing linguists and how they formulate the language dialect dichotomy. Uh, so the talk, much of my talk here is about bashing the entire discipline of linguistics. So I'm you know, really here to make friends and influence people, um, but I hope we can have an interesting conversation, conversation anyway. My diagnosis is that the root of the problems that I identify in linguistics have to do with the tendency in linguistics to set a sharp dichotomy between the linguistic and the political. This is the main idea of the talk. Now, the formulation is not always identical. Um, the political is sometimes the socio-political or the sociological. If someone contrasts, you know, from a linguistic point of view with from a sociological point of view, I'm for the purpose of this talk equating the socio-political, the sociological, the social-cultural, the non-linguistic with the political. I'm using political as a sort of catch-all term for all these terminological variants just to, just to sort of save time. But I acknowledge that there are, uh, there are sort of different formulations. The linguistic is also variably formulated. Some of these people contrast from a scientific point of view, from a political point of view. So the terminology is, is, uh, is varied. But the most common terms are the linguistic and the political. And uh, you'll see what I mean. Here's a sample passage. A political definition is the only way of distinguishing between what a language is and what a dialect is. So according to this uh, scholar from Luxembourg, uh, we need to look at politics. A linguistic definition just does not work. So notice that there is a dichotomy here. There's a political definition. That's the only way a linguistics here is viewed as invalid. Uh, he goes on to give some examples, and uh, being from Luxembourg, he ends by discussing the Luxembourg example. He says, uh, if, if we take a non-political definition, do we have to go and tell people in Luxembourg that their language is really only a dialect and they believe otherwise? Try doing that. It will not make you popular in Luxembourg. Last time somebody from outside tried to do that was the Nazis. So anyone who believes that uh, Luxembourg is, uh, is a subcategory of Dutch apparently is a Nazi. Uh, that's a little, uh, you know, sort of a, <laughs> you know, Goodwin's Law um, operating here. Uh, this, uh, this text is actually a little unusual, though, in, um, in appealing so, so broadly to popular opinion. It's uh, more common for linguists to, uh, to sort of dismiss popular opinion as uneducated or uh, as, as non-scientific. Um, the more typical approach for people who emphasize the political sociopolitical, et cetera, over the linguistic is a stance I'm, I'm calling apolitical agnosticism. Here's a very typical example. Uh, Peter Treadgill, who's a 
very well-respected sociolinguist, wrote a textbook. He discusses a whole bunch of standard uh, cases, servant creation, uh, Flemish and Dutch, Luxembourg doesn't make the cut. But there can be no linguistic answer, Fred Gill insists, to these sorts of questions. The answer is political and cultural, linguistics has no role to play. Indeed, he goes on to say, it is only linguists who understand the extent to which these are not linguistic questions. In Treadgill's account, linguists are always being approached by non-linguists who say, oh, you're a linguist, please tell me, serve in creation, one language or two. And the linguist must say, I'm very sorry, I cannot help you. This is not a linguistic question. This is a political and cultural question. It is only I as a linguist who know that this is a, a political and cultural question, not a linguistic question. I cannot help you. Now, uh, as a description of how linguists approach the language dialect dichotomy, I must say, I, I think Treadgill doesn't know what he's talking about. Here, for example, is a, is a linguist, Mark Greenberg at the University of Auckland, a very nice guy, I might add, who wrote a pretty well received and not bad book on language and identity in the Balkans. And in the introduction to this book, published in Oxford University Press, he tells a little anecdote. He was at an embassy in Belgrade, a distinguished guest heard you're a linguist and came up to me. And just as Treadgill had said, asked him the question, Serbocrat, one language or two. And did he, did Greenberg say, I am sorry, I cannot help you. This is a political cultural question, not a linguistic question. No, he did not. He talked about the unity of the language. He talked about the belief that there was only one language. Indeed, he said it seemed obvious to him. And this is, a, this is a, interesting to me because the obviousness can go on both directions. Uh, Trudgill said it was obvious. It's not a linguistic question at all. And uh, the, it, the evidence that Greenberg gives is more linguistic. So this leads to the second school, which I'm calling objective assertionism. So here's an example of this. From a linguistic point of view, server creation is a single language. From a social political point of view, the server creation language broke up. So once again, we have a dichotomy, the political on one side, well, socio-political, and the other side, the linguistic. But what's different here is which side we prioritize. Here's another example. Nationalist leaders decided to refer to the same variants, Serbian creation and Bosnian, later Montenegrin, but they did so on political grounds, not linguistic grounds. But from a linguistic point of view, he says, we have to see Serbian creation as one language. Don't pay attention to this politics. The linguistics is what matters. Serbian creation is a case in point. Political circumstances have brought about separate developments for two variants of a single language, but these variants must not prevent us as linguists from treating them as a single language. It's as if the politics in this case is some sort of taint or stain, which the proper linguist must avoid getting on his hands. You have to stay clean from this filthy politics. So the objective assertionists um, do not want you to look at the political. And their objective, I suggest, in two senses. Uh, they, they're objective in that they believe that there is an objective truth to be determined through linguistics. We know that server creation is one language, and we know that on objective linguistic grounds. But they're also objective in the sense that they claim for themselves to be objective. There's very little sense in the... Uh, in the um, objective assertionists, of uh, legitimate disagreement. There's, uh, I have my preferred classification, whether it's that it's a language or that it's a dialect, and that is objective because I'm objective. And anyone who entertains another idea must have been tainted by the wicked politics. So I am objective and anyone who disagrees with me is political and that that's a problem. Now this leads to, um, to Chomsky, who's a very interesting case. Um, he asked the question, why is Chinese a language? Why are the Romance languages different languages? He says the answers are political, not linguistic. So in this sense, he seems like, a, uh, like an agnostic. He's very clear that the language dialect dichotomy, in his view, is not a linguistic concept. Indeed, he goes on to say that uh, language, in the sense of not a dialect, he doubts that it can be an object of serious study. He sort of conflates, uh, conflates the idea of the political with things that cannot be serious. There's linguistics and it's serious, but the idea of seriously studying politics doesn't seem to enter his mind. 
it's quite remarkable for someone with uh, such a history of political commentary to equate the political with the not serious, with things that cannot be legitimately discussed. In another passage published later in his life, he uh, goes on to say that dialects are non-linguistic notions, dialects in the sense of not a language. And he gives some examples of some sort of the non-linguistic factors that might come up. Factors such as conquests, natural barriers, oceans and mountains, national TV, et cetera, very open-ended list. But what he says about these non-linguistic factors is that they don't count. They merely induce illusions. So if you thought that say the Arab conquest had any effect on the Persian language or that the Norman conquest might've influenced English or that the Spanish conquest might've influenced the languages of Mexico, well, you have suffered from an induced illusion according to Chomsky. The true linguistic reality is not affected by such mere trifles. Now, um, Chomsky in this passage has, a, I think, a, a passage that's really worth analyzing in detail. I took sort of a deep dive into this particular passage. Um, so I wanna, I wanna walk you through it here. He starts off by saying the language dialect dichotomy has the socio-political dimension. So let's see what a socio-political dimension looks like. He says, we speak of Chinese as a language, although the various Chinese dialects are diverse as the several Romance languages. It's the same example he gave in another passage. Now, the first bit, he says, we speak of Chinese as a language. And I think this passage is inescapably ambiguous. It's not clear who this we is that speaks of Chinese as a language. I can think of at least three interpretations of this passage and maybe more, maybe it's ambiguous. Here are the three interpretations I can think of. The we that speaks of Chinese as a language might be the royal we. Chomsky might, Chomsky's claim might, you might be able to rephrase it as follows. I, the great and learned Chomsky, I speak of Chinese as a language. And you readers just take my word for it because you know I'm so fancy, I'm the great Chomsky. Let's uh, be generous to Chomsky and assume this isn't what he means. The second possible interpretation is he may mean we in the sense of I and the reader. So the inclusive we. In that case, you could, um, you could rephrase the passage as follows. You, the reader, and I, the author Chomsky, we both speak of Chinese as a language. This is something uncontroversial and obvious. We can just take this for granted. Well, I think that's a little bold for Chomsky to assume what the reader is thinking. Uh, so I think that's problematic as well. But what I think he's really saying is we, that he is speaking for his discipline, we linguists, we linguists speak of Chinese as a language, and you readers who are not linguists, trust our collective expertise as linguists. We know what we're talking about. We're linguists after all. So I'm gonna analyze Chomsky's passage on the assumption that he means we in this sense, we linguists. So let's go back to it. We linguists, we experts, we speak of Chinese as a language, even though the various Chinese dialects are as diverse as the Romance languages. So think about what he's assuming here. He assumes that there's something called linguistic diversity. He assumes that that linguistic diversity can be measured. I think he's assuming that the measurement of linguistic diversity had, can be measured quantitatively. And I think that because he asserts that the diversity within Chinese and the diversity within Romance can be meaningfully compared. We can look at two Chinese varieties or three Chinese varieties, measure the linguistic differences and get whatever figure we get. Then we're gonna measure the equivalent figures for French, Italian, Spanish, whatever. And we can compare those numbers meaningfully and find that they're the same. That's what he's asserting here. So this is how I read this. Now Chomsky does not provide any definition of linguistic uh, diversity. He doesn't give any indication about how to measure it, much less cite figures from lexical statistical experiments. He just sort of assumes this is all there. Secondly, he has this passage about Dutch. We speak of Dutch and German as two separate languages, although some dialects of German are very close to dialects we call Dutch, and not the issue entirely well with others that we call German. So let's walk through this. We speak of Dutch and German as two separate languages. Again, I think a claim about what experts believe, followed by a passage about linguistic difference, closeness is the exact word, and mutual intelligibility. 
Now, once again, he does not give a definition of mutual intelligibility. He does not tell how mutability can be analyzed. There's, he's not interested in any of these technical details. But he assumes that you can take two varieties and say this one is or is not mutually intelligible with that one. There's no sense of uh, partial intelligibility in his analysis. Mutual intelligibility is an either or, but can be objectively determined. So if you look at the passage as a whole, he has two linguistic criteria, distance and mutual intelligibility, which he doesn't you know, say how you can analyze, but assumes could be analyzed. But they both seem to me to be purely linguistic criteria. He then compares them to the, uh, the opinion of we, of what we think, which I'm interpreting, and you can disagree with me if you like, as interpreting as expert opinion. So the expert opinion does not agree with the measurements. Clearly something has gone wrong with the purely linguistic criteria. Therefore, it's sociopolitical. So in Chomsky's mind, the sociopolitical, what does that mean? <coughs> It's essentially a synonym for not linguistic, which uh, I think is really remarkable for someone who, again, uh, is so famous for his uh, uh, political commentary. Final thing to note about Chomsky's passage is he cites the Weinreich witticism. Weinreich is like with an army and navy. And indeed, Chomsky is very fond of this witticism. He cites it at least three times in his published works. So it clearly uh, plays a role in his thinking at, at some level. Um, so, as, uh, as Raph uh, pointed out, I have uh, published on the binary criticism. Uh, so, you know, please go ahead and read the article. I want to just give a, a, a couple of the conclusions of that article because I think it's relevant. Uh, the first conclusion is that linguists citing the binary criticism do not cite it correctly. Uh, these are the uh, scholars who have been falsely attributed with the binary criticism, and I, I can't guarantee that it's an exhaustive list. Now you may uh, wonder, looking at all this list of people uh, who have falsely been attributed with the witticism, what Weinreich is doing on the list. See at the bottom, Euro Weinreich? Why is Weinreich a false citation? Because it's actually his father, Max Weinreich. So uh, please be aware that the author date citation system can, uh, can confuse you, oh linguists. There's two Weinreichs and they both published. Total, less than half of uh, linguistic sources I found uh, with this database I constructed with the help of some more technically inclined colleagues, less than half of linguists can attribute the witticism to Max Weinreich correctly. Uh, and only uh, not one in 20 can cite the witticism correctly. Uh, it's, it's remarkable how many people cite uh, the wrong source for tracking down the original witticism. Furthermore, uh, linguists repeating the witticism do not get the words right. Uh, just uh, one sample flag, show, uh, sample PowerPoint slide showing the variety of wording that the witticism has been cited from. And notice the quotation marks in all of these passages. Uh, these are all given as if cited from the original passage, but the, the text differs. And uh, none, spoiler alert, none of them are correct. So linguists don't necessarily know anything about Max Weinreich, and they don't cite the exact wording correctly. What are they doing with the witticism? And I think that the witticism is useful for linguists coping with the language dialect dichotomy because it allows them to ridicule the political uh, aspect of the dichotomy that they're not um, interested in analyzing. Here's, for example, a sample passage about Romani, so the language of, of Roma, the language of gypsies. Uh, witticism. Language is like with a state and army behind it. What work is the witticism doing in this passage? Well, it's there to point out that the distinction between the language and dialect is political, not based on the nature of the language. We have here, it would seem from this passage, an apolitical agnostic. I'm a linguist, I can't possibly know if this is a, a language or dialect because it's not a linguistic question. This is for some non-linguist to answer. But the author on the same page claim that Romani is a language in the fullest sense of the term, whatever that means. But what it seems to mean, then the evidence is that it has vocabulary and grammar of a unique pattern. Now, I don't know what you think, oh, audience out there in Zoom land, but I would say that vocabulary and unique grammatical structure are more to do with the nature of the language than politics. So it seems to me that this author has contradicted himself fairly spectacularly. <clears throat> 
Here's another example, witticism. This is in a discussion of Pontic Greek. Is Pontic a language? It's impossible for the linguist to answer categorically. Maybe some non-linguist, a political actor, a political scientist, some non-linguist could answer that question, but not a linguist. Because we linguists know that this is some sort of political thing, nothing to do with linguistics. But the same author on the next page says, linguistically speaking, it would be absurd not to see Pontic Greek as a dialect of modern Greek. So the thing that is impossible on one page is absurd not to do on the next page. The most dramatic example of this cognitive dissonance I found in a single paragraph by Ruth Sanders in A, a History of German. Here's uh, the first sentence of the paragraph. The language dialect distinction is not firm, often made on cultural, political, rather than linguistic grounds. So we have here the uh, agnosticism again. Witticism, yet Yiddish, which is the, the point of this paragraph, is a language and not a dialect. And how do we know? Here are the features given. Cultural separation, vocabulary, syntax, pronunciation, writing system. Now to me, those seem more linguistic grounds than cultural political grounds. The only non-linguistic thing is cultural separation. And then if you analyze it, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a circular argument. What are the cultural grounds? Cultural separation. It seems a bit of a, a circular argument. Not really a, a very nuanced cultural description of cultural separation. Now, the Weimar criticism, I think, links to the political and links to this dichotomy between the political and the apolitical. And you can see that in some further passages. Uh, witticism, and these, these uh, passages I want to look at, they give the witticism and then they explain it. In other words, so what do these scholars think the witticism means? They think it means it's a question of power. It's a matter of who has the power, it's a matter of political power, it's politics behind the language. And I think in all these passages, political power means not linguistics, therefore something that's beyond our capacity as linguists to ever possibly analyze. Here's some more, witticism, in other words, and these are more specific, check this out. The language dialect is dichotomy is decided by what? An independent nation state, the state, where society draws it, and on speakers' perceptions. And I want to point out to you just how different these four passages are. An independent nation state restricts what kind of state we're talking about. The British Empire apparently has no power to, chain, to affect the way people see language and dialect in India because the British Empire wasn't a nation state. The Soviet Union has no effect. In the second passage, the British Empire and the Soviet Union can have an impact, because it's the state that matters. But in the third passage, it's society. And I put it to you that society and the state may be at odds with each other. There may be tensions between the society and the state. These two things cannot be conflated. And finally, at the bottom, speakers' perceptions, which uh, would seem also to exclude uh, several types of state, because sometimes people are governed by a state of another, of another uh, speakers of another language. Now, uh, these sets of ruminations led me back to Chomsky. And uh, I thought it might be useful to examine just one of Chomsky's claims, put it under the microscope and fact check it. And this is the passage I wanted to cite. We, which I'm interpreting as we experts, we speak of Dutch and German as two separate languages. Now, uh, this can be analyzed simply as a factual statement. Do experts actually speak of Dutch and German as separate languages? I think we can uh, debunk this claim. If we find some experts, some linguists, some philologists who do not speak of Dutch and German as separate languages, then Chomsky's claim here is simply wrong. That might have interesting consequences for Chomsky's argument about the language dialect dichotomy. So I went around looking for people who viewed Dutch as a dialect of German. And uh, spoiler alert, it wasn't hard to find them. I found uh, two groups of people who deny the languagehood of Dutch in related to German. And uh, the first uh, group of people are German philologists. So here, for example, Gottlieb Weinberger, 1838, the meaning and worth of German dialects. Uh, and it says in the middle, the Dutch dialect is fundamentally not its own language, but a German dialect. It's as clear a statement as you could ask for. The Brockhaus Conversation Lexicon, which is an encyclopedia, 
terms of the Dutch language, that it is nothing more than a dialect of German. This is not a separate language, according to uh, this reference work. And that's actually common in several reference, reference works. There are very complicated taxonomies of the dialects and subdialects of German. In this uh, particular one, um, the Universal Lexicon der Gegenwart Vergangenheit, the German language is divided into Upper German and Lower German. And then Lower German B is divided in turn into Plattdeutsch, Westfalisch, Flandrian, or the Niederländisch, or uh, Niederrhenisch. So once again, Flandrian or Dutch, a, uh, a subdialect of the Lower German dialect of German. There are two main dialects of the German language, and Lower German has as a subcategory Dutch. The German Mundarts, uh, German dialects include Dutch, and again, part of Niederfrankish Frankish this time uh, as an alternative for Nieder Deutsch. So Lower Frankish instead of Lower German. Uh, the, the Dutch language of all German dialects is the only one which has become an independent Schriftsprache. So there's a concept of Dutch being a Schriftsprache and a Mundart at the same time. That's kind of interesting that the Schriftsprache and Mundart can coexist with each other. Just as the political borders of the German Reich are not the borders of the German tongue, so they are nowhere the border of dialects. One speaks the same dialect on both sides of the Dutch state border, according to this source. So here there's not even a, a dialectical distinctiveness of Dutch. The Dutch dialects are similar to some German dialects. Uh, the German dialectical maps clearly include the Dutch territory. This one's maybe not quite as visual as that one, but it's the same border if you look. Uh, Dutch and uh, the Flemish region of Belgium are clearly places where German dialects are spoken. This one was published after the uh, Second World War. And you can see that it is updated as far as the Eastern borders of German are concerned. You can see the dotted line in uh, Silesia and Pomerania showing the location of the former German speaking zone, where, but the Germans don't live there anymore and the dialects are no longer spoken there. But even this person who takes into account the Second World War in the East still sees uh, uh, Holland and um, the Flemish region of Belgium as a part of the German speaking region. Now this is a later edition of that same, uh, same map. And here you can see that the, the Dutch and the Flemish is excluded from the German zone. But if you look closer, you get a, kind of an interesting thing. You can see that the little dotted line is still there the way it was in all the previous maps. I think this may be an example of censorship. I think that the person who drew the map originally probably thinks that Dutch and Flemish are part of the German speaking zone. And uh, that suspiciously straight line is evidence of some sort of political censorship. Again, politics comes into play in the, in the most uh, purely linguistic texts, if you uh, scratch the surface at all. Um, the political content is perhaps most spectacular um, in the case of Gerhard Schmidt Rohr, this gentleman. Uh, Gerhard Schmidt Rohr was an was a enthusiastic member of the Nazi party. This is actually his uh, Nazi party membership badge. It's the only photograph of him I could find online. During the Second World War, shortly after the uh, conquest of the Netherlands, he uh, basically wrote a, a pamphlet trying to get a job heading a linguistic institute and uh, submitted it to the Nazi government. And in that text, he said that the, the Dutch and the Flemish, insofar as they speak their dialect, are speaking a German dialect, just as we do here in the Reich. Therefore, let's have a linguistic uh, you know, institute and can convince them that they're Germans. You know, They can be Heimens Reich. The Nazis weren't interested in this. He didn't get anywhere with it, but he made the claim, just as our Luxembourg colleague uh, earlier might have suggested. Now, um, I've, I've given you only people who are viewing Dutch as a, as a part of German. It's fair to note just uh, as a rebuttal that it's not a universal opinion. It's uh, not difficult to find, for example, the work of uh, Jan Gusens. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who uh, asked the question, are the dialects of the Netherlands and Flanders German? The answer can only be no, absolutely not. This is not the case. But it's fair to note that this text by Gusens is actually uh, much more tainted by politics than that of Schmidt Rohr. Schmidt Rohr was appealing to the state, but was turned down. Nazis didn't buy his argument. This text, however, was actually published by the, the uh, Dutch embassy in Bonn. 
It's actual government propaganda funded and paid for by a state. It uh, would seem to be even more taint about politics than the Nazi. So it can still be political, even if the uh, conclusion is something that you might uh, agree with. The second example I want to give concerns Anglophone linguists who uh, generally do not aspire to, um, to incorporate the Netherlands in their own language region and therefore make a more interesting example of denying the separate languagehood of, uh, of Dutch. So here's a sample passage from uh, George Traeger. Uh, it says, the Netherlands and Northern Germany, uh, it's difficult to say if one language here or more than one. Now the point is not that Dutch is a subcategory of German. The point is that the language border between the Dutch zone and the German border may not be a proper language border. He doesn't give any sort of overarching name for the common language. He merely doubts the existence of a transition from one language to another between Dutch and German. He's talking about a dialect continuum. And that's very common when people are talking about dialect continuum, or in this case, a dialect chain. There are three languages, standard German, standard Dutch, Luxembourgish, Luxembourg lives on forever. But these languages are separated by things political, not linguistic. And we've seen that the political in the mouth of a linguist is a taint, a stain to be, to be avoided. From a linguistic point of view, we must ignore the politics. Therefore, from a linguistic point of view, we must insist that these three languages are really one. In the North, uh, German, Dutch, and Dutch speakers speak the same language, as clear as you could ask for. They may be taught a different standard language in school, yes, but this is a political and social matter, not a linguistic matter. And therefore it doesn't count, according to this author. Along the Dutch-German border, they speak the same Low Franconian. Once again, the language border between Dutch and German is denied the status of being a transition from one language to another. Dutch and German are still treated as separate. Again, there's no name for the common language, but there's also a, a denial that there is a language border between two separate languages. They are separated sociolinguistically, but not linguistically. There is a continuum of dialects across the political boundaries of Holland and Germany. This is one language. It's true that Dutch and German are claimed to be different languages, but what do we make of this claim? We merely explain why it's an error. And this text, by the way, comes from uh, Chomsky's doctoral supervisor. Linguistically speaking, Dutch could be a dialect of German and Bavarian an independent language. Why is Dutch considered a language stone and Bavarian a dialect? Well, we have the witticism, of course, but this I think is the most interesting passage that I'm gonna show you today. The decision is arbitrary. Now, in most of the other passages that I showed you with this sort of general line of argument, the person said the decision is political or sociopolitical or political and cultural. Well, we've seen the terminology varies. But we have the linguistics on the one side and the political on the other side. But in this passage, we have linguistics on one side and then something that is arbitrary. So I think this is then the problem with linguistics. They don't think politics can be studied. They view the things that are political as arbitrary, as random and capricious, but fundamentally as beyond the capacity of human beings to study. I think this is a disciplinary boundary decision. Linguists aren't trained to study politics, but other people are. So maybe if this is a, not a linguistic matter, you should cede the study of languages and dialects to historians or political scientists or anthropologists or sociologists. Politics can be studied. Now in uh, previous uh, talks when I've uh, made this sort of argument before, I once had a question from, uh, from a member of the audience, what do I want from linguists? I thought it was a good question. So let me give you just a couple of quick answers. If you want to study politics, here's a tip. You have to be specific in what you study. Linguists, I think, are too trained to think in terms of anonymous informants. Anonymous informants is not a good way of studying politics. You can't study something like uh, Churchill's speeches and say an allied politician once said, it's important to know whether it was Churchill or Roosevelt or de Gaulle. Linguists have a, a tendency to use the passive voice when discussing these sorts of things. This is a passage by Peter Auer, who I understand is very well uh, respected in uh, European linguistic circles. Bavarian is considered a dialect of German. Is it? 
by whom? If we look at the, the Dutch German question from Chomsky, uh, we can see that there's a great complex, fascinating story of who exactly considers what and why. The passive voice is a problem, but Peter Auer is very fond of the passive voice. I suggest that the passive voice obscures the agent ought to be uh, discarded when analyzing politics. When Peter Auer does consider who does this sort of considering, calling, taking, and so forth, he uses very vague actors, others, many, some. We need to be more specific. So that's my first tip for linguists who want to cope with the language dialect dichotomy. My second uh, tip for you is to remember that language dialect specification is a judgment of importance. If someone wishes to emphasize differences or if someone wishes to emphasize similarities, they will find reasons to do so. I think linguists are used to analyzing um, claims in their discipline as correct or incorrect, that there's a right answer or a wrong answer. But when we study the judgments of historical actors or the judgments of political actors, we have to just uh, see what people think and, and investigate why, without necessarily saying that they're right or wrong. Why do people support the Communist Party? Why do people support the Christian Democratic Party? If you're, if you're thinking to yourself, well, they're wrong to support this party, they are right to support that party, it's gonna get in the way of analyzing why people understand, why people support the party they do. Similarly, if you are very persuaded that variety X is a dialect or variety X is a separate language, that's going to get in your way of understanding why other people might disagree with you. That's my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Alexander, for this great, challenging and thought provoking uh, presentation uh, in which you've presented extensive uh, evidence, extensive source material. Um, and uh, yeah, the audience we have gathered here today is, is very diverse. It consists of historians, of linguists, uh, of classicists, also of students. Uh, from, from the University of Graz, whom I'm encouraging especially to, to ask questions. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very much interested uh, to learn um, yeah, what their questions are, what their thoughts are, and, and I'm opening up the, the floor for, for questions to, to them. So please, uh, if you want to, to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand um, using the, the Zoom function or do it perhaps physically um, to make that happen. It, can perhaps be interesting for Alexander to stop sharing. Thanks a lot. Um, so yes, yeah. and I'll I'll open the chat window in case someone has trouble um, with oh, the yeah. mic or something like that. Yeah, and you can also ask questions through uh, through the chat, of course. So please feel free to ask a question um, to Alexander. Who wants to go first? Not all at once. <laughs> Maybe I, oh, there is uh, one by Luke Ellison. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ellison. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking out loud kind of, I'm still kind of processing the talk. It was very, very fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, I come from a typological background and I wondering whether or not you can fit if you think that um, the differences between languages can be typologized, you can say that the difference between Dutch and German is similar to the difference between such and such. Um, like you compare, like people, sorry, the sources that you quoted have compared romance to Chinese, um, saying that the levels of differences and similarities can uh, in some ways similar. So do you think that these types of categories uh, or can be uh, uh, that we can create a set of labels um, like that are politically neutral, so to speak. Uh, do I think you can create uh, politically neutral labels? I'm very skeptical that you can make something politically neutral. I mean, there's a bit where your question becomes easy to answer. The political yeah. neutral bit is going to be hard. Um, if you are interested in saying, okay, these Chinese words are different in their initial consonant after a rising tone, or these uh, romance, uh, you know, uh, plosives have become devoiced, or something like that. 
well, you linguists are better capable than I to understand what that's all about. So, you know, knock yourselves out and have fun. But perhaps but we I can also... Very, I think it's very difficult to um, draw broader comparisons between um, an observation about those two things. Um, in trying to ponder how you might fact check Chomsky's claim that the diversity of Chinese is similar to the diversity within Romance, I eventually concluded that the only hint of reasonable data is lexical statistics, because the, the, the vocabulary word being the same or not being the same is something that you can measure in different parts of the world. I found studies attempting to quantify the divergence within Romance varieties and the divergence within Chinese varieties, but the figures didn't seem to be very comparable uh, across linguistically. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of problems with lexical statistics. And I'm actually trying to publish on lexical statistics a little bit. I published one article, I've got another one nearly ready to go. But uh, the main finding I have about lexical statistics is that there's a margin of error. And the margin of error is significant. And what that significant margin of error means is that you can never use it to resolve a dispute like the language dialect dispute. Because the language dialect dispute implies that there's some sort of magic number that when the, if you had some sort of objective measure of linguistic difference, and let's say it's a percentage, that if that magic accurate linguistic measure of difference were more than 80% similar, then it would be a dialect or less, it would become a separate language. And there'd be some sort of magic threshold. But if your data is so imprecise that you have a plus, you know, plus 10 imprecision on either side, it's not gonna help. I think less good statistics can tell us that Chinese is a different language from Spanish. But we frankly don't need lexical statistics to tell us that. We can, we can believe that on our own. But if we have any case that's in any way close to being problematic, Romance languages or Dutch German, the margin of error is gonna prevent us from making any decisions. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, sorry. I, I don't think I meant to use the term politically neutral because I, uh, yeah, I also intended um, maybe we can combine these linguistic factors with um, political factors like uh, say shared heritage, like a Germanic and Romance, um, but also you have uh, um, uh, natural borders and stuff. Uh, so maybe- can I, we... can I ask how you will determine whether a heritage is shared? I mean, you make it sound like you have some sort of shared heritage detector. And you're going to point it at Dutch and German, and it's go ding. Heritage is shared. I mean, how is how does that work? Can no, well, it has to be a multivariate. Um, there, yeah, it wouldn't be a binary, I suppose. Yeah. But, so. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, it I, like I think you can see the problems, you know, yeah, unfolding yeah. in front of you. Yeah. So fundamentally, though, the these questions seem to be aimed at how can we get the right answer. We want to find out the truth of whether or not Dutch and German are separate. We want to find out the truth of whether Serbian and Croatian are separate. And I suggest to you that that's the wrong answer. These are value questions. You have to look at the question, a statement like Dutch is just a dialect of German. You shouldn't view as a statement like the capital of Holland is Amsterdam. You should view it as a statement like the National Socialist Party is the wrong party, or the Socialist Party is the best party. It's a it's an opinion. And the opinion may be a consensus opinion, or it may be a controversial opinion, or it may be a crazy oddball opinion, but it's still an opinion. And it has to be analyzed as an opinion. Furthermore, I think it's an opinion with very important political consequences. If you look at the laws of the European Union or the laws of you know international law, very frequently people have the right, for example, to uh, ha have schooling in their native language or to have uh, court proceedings be held in their own language. I'm not aware of any place that gives rights to court proceedings in their own dialect. So there's a lot at stake if you can win recognition of languagehood. It's a highly political issue. And so it's contested for political reasons inherently. Uh, so I think the desire to say, well, let's try to see if we can think of an objective way. It, it's, a, it's a fool's errand. That's what I think. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thanks for a great question and a great discussion. I see that Sarah Melgar has raised uh, her hand. So please go ahead and ask your question.
you're on mute. Very much. Thanks very much for this really interesting talk. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a linguist. I'm here for remedial purposes. It's really embarrassing to see sociolinguists get it so wrong. Um, but I actually have a question to make use of your wider expertise now that it was um, put out there at the start of the talk. Um, and my question is, since you have experience of so many different fields, um, in particular, it, um, it really drew my attention, the science fields. So a lot of my close family members are in different sciences. And I know that they're always fighting over what belongs where. And I actually started out as a geologist and a geologist would say, well, we're all just, we do physics and biology, but all together. Are there lessons for this um, linguistic and political science, or that was probably the wrong order, um, for this attention from other fields that have worked it out well, like conferences or journals or just any sort of thing? Wow, this is really not a question I'm used to getting. <laughs> Um, my undergraduate degree was a double major in history and physics. And at the time I was studying physics and history was a hobby. Um, I quit physics and I'm glad that I quit physics. I think I would have been an unsuccessful and unhappy physicist. Um, I feel like I'm much better suited to history as a, as a subject. But I'm still very glad that I studied physics and I'm glad that other people are doing physics. I think physics is a wonderful field. Um, so when I was a physics major and I would see political scientists claiming to have a science, I would scoff and mock and, you know, think that they had physics envy and make fun of them. And now that I've been outside of physics for a long time and seen a lot of people with physics envy, and I should add Chomsky has a lot of physics envy. He repeatedly describes linguistics as pre-Galilean, you know, pathetic. Uh, but I have to say, from outside physics now, I have a little more sympathy with physics envy. Who wouldn't have physics envy? Physics is fantastic. What an incredible subject. And they have such confidence in their truth claims. So I guess I'm a little more sympathetic to physics envy. But uh, as for my own discipline history, I don't think we have much uh, uh, physics envy. We're happy to be in the humanities. And we have different tools because there are different types of questions. A lot of the questions that we ask in the humanities don't have right or wrong answers. You're trying to understand what people are thinking and the thoughts people have could be wrong. If you are um, you know, studying the history of, of Roman religion, it doesn't help you to say, well, these gods didn't exist. This is not helpful. You're studying the imagination. The imagination is what it is. And I think if you study nationalism, you're studying the imagination. People imagine the nation in this way, they imagine the nation that way. And those imaginations have consequences for how people behave, have consequences for how history unfolds. And it's, uh, it's important and interesting and worth studying. Um, so the fact that we can't measure the imagination and we can't make mathematical nomothetic laws about how the imagination functions, well, that's just inherent to the problem. But something like nationalism is important for understanding things like World War II. You have a question like, why did Germany lose World War II? That's a question that's worth asking. And the fact that you can't answer it in a nomothetic, you know, scientific way, the way a physicist would like, with answers correct to five decimal points, because the answers to that question aren't numerical. Okay, we can't use the physics methodology for this question. It's still an interesting question that's worth answering, worth asking and debating. Does that answer your question? It's certainly given me a lot to think about. So thank you for that answer. Yes. Well, it's definitely a pet rant of mine, but totally unrelated to the talk I gave. So uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Other thoughts, comments? Yeah, please go ahead if there are any other questions or remarks or thoughts. Maybe I can ask a question while we're, oh, there's one by Marianne Cruz. So go ahead, please. Well, it's not Marianne Cruz, it's her husband. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's Pierre Swiggers uh, from Leuven. Um, I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm, simply, I'm simply using the computer of my wife. So, so you, you will not be hearing a Spanish dialect or language, but, uh, something like uh, English English with uh, a Dutch or a Flemish accent. I just had um, well, I had a number of, of questions, but uh, 
my my main question would be um how would the picture look um so you gave a, a very nice overview of what linguists and not only linguists have said about this this uh thorny uh, issue, but how would the picture look if you also um, uh, were to take into account, I would say the first, the professional, the specifically professional background of, of the linguist and then also the, the political situation at the time. So for instance, if, if you look at uh, a number of the, the authors you, you quoted, uh, a number of them belong to uh, or were really professional pra practitioners of historical comparative linguistics. And so often they speak of dialect eh, in terms of what, well, what, what is an offshoot of an ancestral language. Hmm? And so this explains, for instance, why if, if you look at most of the publications of the first half of the 19th century, when they speak about Deutsch, it can mean Germanic and it can mean German. And so that's 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 a fundamental ambiguity. And uh, if you take the example of Meillet, uh, Meillet uh, has a work about Les Dialectes Indo-Européens, um, which all became which all became languages uh, and even I would say uh, sometimes polycentric languages. So I think the the background uh, uh, and the the professional the professional well the the specialization of of the linguist in question uh, really matters a lot. And then of course also the 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 political situation at the time. So, for instance, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Chris Lianovic. Uh, well, of course, he was writing, well, he was, first of all, he was writing at the time when Dobrovsky had uh, shown the, the unity of the, the Slavic languages, and etc. So there is also the, the concept of the common, the common Slavic language from which then Croatian, uh, Serbian descended, etc. But then, not only this political, this linguistic context, but the political context of the fact that uh, we have, we we are dealing with a, a, a subject, <laughs> a political subject of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it's, uh, I would say, you can expect that he would rather use the term Mundart uh, and not so much uh, the term uh, Sprache and not so much language. Okay. Well, that as, as it happens, I've been doing research on Dubrovsky, and uh, I have, you know, it would it would probably take me a minute to find. I can show you his actual passages on the on the Slavic language. Um, you know, put them up on the screen if you want to see. Uh, you are absolutely correct that the word mundart or dialect often means subcategory. So Dubrovsky is a great example of that. He says that there's the Slavic language, and the Slavic language is divided into Hauptmundarten. And one of the Hauptmundarten is the Russische Sprache. And then another one of the Hauptmundarten is Serbian, which I think has a Croatian Mundart. So he has a three level classificatory scheme. The top language is a Sprache. Mm -hmm. The middle layer is both Hauptmundart, dialect, and Sprache. And the bottom layer is Mundart. So there's no point trying to fit that into any sense of coherent classification because just as you say, the word uh, mundart does mean subcategory. Mm. Um, as far as your, your broader point that we should look at the political context, I agree, that's what I've been arguing the whole time. But uh, I am a little concerned though, that when you talked about the political context or the background, you emphasize primarily their linguistic training. And I suggest to you that it's also relevant to look at their social class or their mm. religion, or you know, where they went to school. The political context is not just the context of the academy in which they worked, but also mm -hmm. the, the broader political context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So for instance, Meillet, uh, 
Meillet when he wrote about, uh, first of all, about Indo-European dialects, when he wrote about the languages of new uh, the new Europe, uh, so after the Second World War, uh, he also wrote to one of his uh, students and uh, who then was to become also a collaborator, Tenier, and uh, in, his, in his private correspondence, he says, well, I cannot really... Um, um, I would say really feel the delicacy of the problem because I'm not a speaker of of a dialect of French, eh? so I've always spoken, let's say, in, uh, the the standard French language or national French language. Hmm? Hmm. Well, some of the research I've been doing recently is about trying to find out how the language dialect, dialect economy occurs in the works of people who are not linguists. Linguists, we know what linguists say. Forget linguists. Let's look and see what state administrators say. So I looked at the, for example, the, um, the, the form that you fill out if you're an officer in the Habsburg army and mm -hmm. you wanna go apply for a promotion. So one of the things you have to fill out is a bit where you list your Sprachkenntnis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sprachkenntnis. Not Mundartkenntnis, Sprachkenntnis. And then there are instructions. It says you list your knowledge of German first, then you list any languages of the monarchy you speak. So if, you're, you, know, if you have Hungarian or Czech or whatever, and then, or Italian, and then at the bottom, any foreign languages. So you know your French or English would go at the very bottom. But then one of the instructions also says, the uh, Ausdruck Slavisch ist nicht hinreichend, man muss die treffende Mundart nennen. So that seems to imply clear as day, Czech is a Mundart, uh, Polish is a Mundart. And they want you to specify, ich kann Polish sehr gut, but what they don't want is for you to say, ich kann Slavisch sehr gut. Okay, so I find that fascinating because it suggests that the Habsburg military is concerned that officers may claim to speak the Slavic language. And so it says, okay, it's not enough to say you speak Slavic, which Mundart do you speak? Mm -hmm. I find that a really interesting sort of text. And I think it's a sort of text that linguists have not been considering because linguists say, oh, if you look at Millet, if you look at what uh, Adelung has to say, uh, you might try to broaden your horizon when you look at the political context. What does the government administrator say? What does the constitution say? So these are questions I, I would urge people to consider. Thank you for your question. And yeah, thank you for your answer. Yeah, thanks for a great question and a great answer. Um, I'm also very interested in your research on, on, on the state administration and how they engage with the, the language dialect distinction. Or at least. I'm writing a chapter on the Philippines right now. It's so interesting. <laughs> I look yeah, forward to uh, it. Uh, I, I think Nadia has a yeah, question. Nadia has a, has a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, I always forget the microphone. Um, one thing that bothers me about this, and I've been, you know, working a lot exactly on that, is that dialect doesn't mean the same thing in all languages. What is a dialect in English? It's not a dialect in Italian. It's certainly not a dialect in ancient Greek. So dialect, you know, the word, like the de definition of dialect exactly like dialects moves with history and sociology and cultural context. So in English, for example, from the Oxford English Dictionary, you find out that a dialect is what we in Italy would, kind, would call a jargon or you know, a, a very limited idiolect for you know, a small group. In Italian and in Italy, um, a dialect is um, a local language which can often, it's mutually, incomprehensible to other speakers. Um, I visited the language museum in Vilnius years ago and it said that Lithuanian had 15 dialects and the Slovenians claim they have 14 dialects. Now I happen to be a speaker of Slovene because my mother is Slovene and those dialects are just inflections. You know, they're certainly not um, mutually incomprehensible, but yet again, mutually incomprehensible is not a linguistic category um, or 
uh, a cultural category in general, because there are languages, as you said full well, that are mutually perfectly comprehensible, and yet they are different languages, and they would be, you know, well, even if we don't want to go down the, you know, slippery slope of the Croatian and Serbia, and you can say that, you know, Italian and Spanish to an extent are mutually comprehensible, and yet they're different languages and nobody would argue against that. So language is a culture category, basically, as the meta language that defines it. So it has to be seen in its, con I think, in its context every time. Dialect means mutually comprehensible, <laughs> you know, etymologically. And the word dialect came into modern languages in the 16th century. And I suspect that it did, because in the 16th century, uh, what happened is the, the, the what we now call national languages were established and therefore, you know, that category was useful, but it was a generic category, you know, not um, a specific one. Then, you know. Okay, I, the, I've got so much to say. I think I'm going to. I'll shut up. I'm going to have to interrupt you here because, you know, this is going in so many different directions. Um, you start off by saying that we need to look at the ling a unique linguistic um, context. And you said um, the English dialect is like Italian idioma. Okay, so the, the first thing no, I would say yes, is... Though, if you, not, not idioma, no. Well, maybe I got the exact wording correctly, but you said that the, this one English word was equivalent to another word in Italian. And uh, I would suggest to you that in any linguistic context, either English or Italian or German or whatever, that these words have a range of multiple different meanings. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's absurd to say, well, the, the OED says, as if the OED were the uh, ultimate uh, arbiter of how language is actually used in practice. Uh, if you start looking at how people are actually using these words, you'll find a great diversity of meaning in any language I feel confident. Now I, you know, don't speak Italian, so I can't really judge the Italian. But the languages I do speak, it's fascinating the great diversity. You said earlier that uh, dialect means mutual comprehensible. There are lots of people for whom it does. Do you want to cite people who say that? No trouble citing finding people who say that. But you can also find people who say that dialect means not uh, codified. Uh, Haugen, for example, he he talks about the process of how a dialect becomes a language and it becomes a language when people write dictionaries and so on and so forth and standardize and codify. Uh, so that would seem to be a different understanding of what dialect means. And I'm finding in my research in the Philippines that dialect means local language. In the Philippines, they have uh, English is spoken by the Americans and taught in schools. Spanish used to be spoken and is spoken by the elite. And then there are local dialects. And they talk about the local dialects not being mutually comprehensible. And that means that's why we can't use one of them to be the national language. So, you know, I can cite you heaps of sources that do not obey the rule that you asserted. Uh, as, for the origin, as for the origin of the word dialect, I'm not gonna pretend to know anything about it when Raf von Roy is in the chat room. Uh, Raf von Roy is the expert in that. Uh, his, if I understand his story correctly, it agrees with what you said. But uh, as an expert on nationalism, I have to say I'm a little skeptical that 16th century is the beginning of national languages, because I tend to see the beginning of nationalism is coming more, more or less with the French Revolution. So I think the idea of what is national, what's not national is really complicated. So those are my reactions to your comments. Do you want to react to that, Nadia? Or? Uh, just a couple of things. Um, I said national languages, not nationalistic languages. So in the 50s, yeah, that's, the 16th, that's a pretty fine distinction. Well, it's a huge distinction because national doesn't mean nationalistic necessarily, and certainly didn't in the 16th century. So in the 16th century, you see in Europe, I mean, because of course, I mean, I have to say, I unfortunately my gaze doesn't go a lot way beyond that and that's my limitation but anyway um, modern languages in Europe established themselves with you know a proper name um, 
in the 16th century, inclusive of languages like German and Italian that didn't have a nation to go back to until the 19th century, um, second half of it. I said that dialect means mutually comprehensible in ancient Greek, not in, in modern times. And I said that just the word came into Neo-Latin and then Italian and from Italian then around European languages in that period, which dated about 1535. Um, there's a source to it. It's a bloke called Angelo Colocci who uses it for the first, um, for the first time. Um, yeah, that's about it really. Thank you. I remember one other thing I wanted to, to mention. Um, you mentioned that uh, you visited um, Vilnius and you saw in the, in, the, in, the, in the museum, they said, we have this many dialects. And you said in Slovenia, they have that many dialects. And I have to say, I have done some research on how dialects taxonomies come into being. Never mind the languages, let's look at how many dialects come into being. And it's also a very interesting and highly political episode. So if I could just uh, advertise my own work, uh, I wrote a thing on that I called uh, Why the Slovak Language Has Three Dialects, a Case Study in Historical Perceptual Dialectology. Uh, so if you want to get my thoughts on that, uh, I wrote a really fun article about it. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for this great uh, discussion. I could add lots of things about the etymology of dialect, but I don't want to uh, tire our, our audience, of course, and perhaps there are any, is the other, expert on that. any other questions uh, that somebody wants to address to Alexander. Uh, I have plenty of my own, but I don't want to monopolize uh, this discussion, of course, and it's already uh, quarter past 12 here in Belgium. Um, If there are, aren't any further questions, I, I suggest that we thank our speaker, Alexander, Professor Maxwell, one more time for his very inspiring talk. Um, and, and I hope you, you enjoyed it a lot and, and got something out of it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you thank for you. coming. Very kind thank of you, you to uh, give me your time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.